Day two of the Champions League quarterfinals are officially over. The first leg of the ties complete. It's in the books. Let's talk about it. Barcelona versus PSG and Atletico Madrid versus Borussia Dortmund. Now, my initial thoughts before ball was even kicked. I predicted that PSG and Atletico Madrid would go through. One of them is not looking so great. The other one, my prediction so far is actually spot on because I believed Atletico Madrid would beat Dortmund, but I do believe that Dortmund this year are kind of that team that everybody already has these preconceived notions and opinions on, right? They Their opinion of Dortmund is set in stone without even watching them play that much this year. So I kind of believe that while yes, Atletico should be the favorite for this tie there is not that much that separates the two of them let's start with barcelona psg though wow what a game kind of following off the script of yesterday in terms of lots of goals lots of action end to end it was a pretty even game for the most part but let's talk about psg in particular new look team still obviously the man, main man up front and kylian mbappe new coach new sidekicks to, to either side of him but same old story psg failing to get it done now there is of course another 90 minutes to play but if today's anything to go off of, I think PSG will need to improve tenfold if they are to make it to the Champions League semifinal. And with the opportunity at hand, when you look at this side of the bracket, I think every team should be looking at it and fancying themselves that, yeah, we can go deep into this competition. Honestly, man, I wasn't a fan of the way they, they set up from the beginning. It looked like a four in the back on paper, but you could quickly see from the, the opening exchanges that it was almost like a back three slash back five. Now, I would say it's a back three. You had the center back partnership, uh, the center back trio, excuse me. You had Usman Dembele on the right. And you had Nuno Mendes, who was basically playing as not even a wing back. I would say he was playing as a full on winger. You saw from the opening minutes how high he was pressing up, how much he was taking it to Jules Kunde, making La Minha mal track back. And then you had like a whole mess kind of going on in the midfield between Fabian Ruiz, between uh, Vitinha, you had Asensio not really knowing where he was playing, and then Mbappe, who kind of has this free roll up front where he goes where he wants and does what he wants. But I can't lie, man. I, I wasn't a fan of this, to be honest with you. Let's start with the left-hand side. Yes, Mendez was pushing forward, and at the beginning, it looked like he could be a real threat for PSG. But very quickly, it became apparent that Lamine Yamal on the other side was Barcelona's potentially biggest threat. And when you leave that kid that much space because of what Nuno Mendes is occupying on the left-hand side, PSG quickly ended up having balance issues because now that Lamine Yamal is open on the right for that quick switch to play it into him, the entire back three has to shift over, leaving enormous amounts of space on the other side. So Barcelona were really, in my opinion, just dragging PSG's defense back and forth, left to right, left to right. And it didn't take them that long, really, to find an opener in this game. And it came due to Rafinha, but it really started, and I have to give this guy massive credit, due to the brilliant center forward play from Robert Lewandowski. I thought today Lewandowski rolled back the years and showed why. Look, he may not be at his physical best. He might not be at his absolute apex that he was at Bayern Munich and at Dortmund. But quality doesn't die, guys. And this is what I keep trying to tell you guys about pure footballing ability. You guys hate that word, but it's true. Some people are born better at, at things than other people are. And Lewandowski, you can take away his physicality. You can take away his form. He still has things about him that almost no center forward on the planet have. And that ability in the first half to basically pick up the ball and just run and run and run, carry it forward, he at one point had three PSG defenders, midfielders, swarming into him and still having the power to get by them. Then playing Lamine Yamal. So already PSG's defense is a little disoriented. Finding Lamine Yamal. Nuno Mendes already starts off, in my opinion, way too far away from him and kind of like waits for him to make a move. Lamine Yamal doesn't even wait. First time, basically, outside of the foot, Trivella. Donnarumma wants to come out to stop Lewandowski from uh, tapping it into an open net, which... That's up to you guys to decide whether it was the right decision or not. But it falls perfectly to Rafinha, who doesn't have a single man on him within 30 yards to basically put it into the top corner of an empty net. And all of a sudden, it's 1-0 Barcelona. But that was like, for me, the early signs that, look, this PSG setup is way too discombobulated. And like, it almost felt like it was the first time they've ever played that way. I know the absence of Hakimi on the right probably changed the way they wanted to play because most recently, Dembele has almost been playing as an interior. And today he kind of went back to playing as like an out and out wide winger. But yeah, I think like defensively, it left PSG in such a spot of bother so many times. But give credit to PSG because in the second half, I think they pretty quickly realized that Asensio doesn't really have a defined role in this team. In my opinion, it was the wrong decision to start him. And they took him out, brought on uh, Bradley Barcola, who's been playing a lot more recently, especially since the Newcastle game in, at the beginning of the season, which completely shifted the momentum of, of PSG season. But he came onto the right. Dembele went on the left. Again, Mbappe with that free roll. And from the word jump, PSG got themselves back into the game in the second half. Within five, six minutes, the, flip, the, the script completely flipped. It went from 1-0 Barcelona 
the 2-1 PSG. Dembele, who was probably a typical Dembele performance today, man. A lot of promise, a lot of like extravagance, but not a lot of end product, right? Getting himself in the good positions, failing to find the final pass. Went one-on-one -on -one at one point, hitting the post, but the second half, he came out with a bang very quickly and picks up the ball from probably his own missed cross on the top of the box, shimmies past Frankie and just unleashes the strike that, look, I'm sure Barca fans will be saying they want to, to save that, but I think that's unstoppable. I think that strike from Dembele is legitimately unstoppable just like that it's 1-1 and then all of a sudden it was kind of like the, the Madrid game right like that screamer kind of took away the great half Barcelona had just been playing and then Barcelona kind of found themselves in a lull and PSG took advantage of it a second time very very quickly after where you have some nice sequences on the right hand side Fabian Ruiz finds I believe it was who Vitinha kind of running the box Vitinha lovely finish in the, into the the bottom corner and like I said just like that all of Barca's good work in the first half is gone like that and, and PSG found themselves back in the game and again it was PSG actually who were looking for the third trying to take the initiative trying to push it to Barcelona but Barcelona defended exceptionally well and I think three players in particular hell I'll say four I think the whole back line deserves credit Jao Cancelo on the left Koundé on the right who I think at the beginning of the game up against Mbappe would have really like a lot of people would have doubted his cap capability to, to defend a player like Mbappe kept Mbappe quiet we'll talk about that in a bit and then the center back partnership uh, Araujo and uh Corbasi wow first of all Corbasi is is a joke man he's an absolute joke we often talk about 16 year old Lamine Yamal but 17 year old Paul Corbasi wow <laughs> La, La Masia you've done it again man you're a genius the passing capacity on this kid right here special this kid is an absolute joke with the ball at his feet but then defensively too let's not act like this kid is like Eric Garcia or something like that on the on the ball he's amazing defensively as well too every single challenge PSG threw at him he had an answer for it and then next to him you have the perfect in my opinion center back partnership for that kind of defender that Corbassi is and Corbassi you have the more smooth operator the ball playing center back Arojo is a wall bro that guy is an absolute beast of a defender I've been a fan of him I went and watched him at uh in the Europa League last year against United home and away he's one of the few players I've seen when Rashford was on that form lock up Rashford when he was on that form against Vinny they even move him at right back just to play against Vinicius Jr so again another massive game from Arojo I thought the whole back four from PSG was or from Barcelona excuse me was absolutely brilliant but let's not stop them from uh speaking also about the midfield Gundogan was typical Gundogan in my opinion but the other two, I wasn't too keen on. Roberto, at this level, I'm not a huge fan of, but I get it. He fulfills a role for Barcelona. But I think they looked better when he got off. And Frankie was his first game kind of coming back. Had some nice touches, but again, not my favorite performance from Frankie Dion. But who I did like was Pedri Gonzalez. And this is where, from giving the credit to Xavi, from uh, Enrique, I have to give the credit to Xavi. The substitutions that Xavi made in the second half of the game completely changed the dynamic of the game first of all bringing on Pedri was a master stroke obviously I mean like I can't give him too much credit because it's Pedri right like you have an amazing player on the bench you bring him on he's gonna make a difference but the difference he made in such a short amount of time Pedri receives it kind of hesitates a little and you're thinking mm, what's he gonna do but it's almost like hesitating for half a second just to allow Rafinha enough distance to break away from his defender and make that run behind and Pedri so delicately so expertly chips the ball lofts it it's like he caresses it just one swift caress of the boot over the top perfectly finds Rafinha on a plate a golden platter and it's a brilliant finish from Rafinha it's a great run it's a great goal from Rafinha he strikes it exceptionally well he had an amazing game but Pedri shows that quality no matter what anyone says will always be and especially in the Champions League like I said yesterday those individual moments of quality will always decide the top end games and Pedri, man, instant impact. That's what you call it. That pass was a joy to watch and kind of like a reminder to everyone who's been watching Bellingham, Musiala, uh, obviously you have Yamal, Endrick, all these young players. Let's not forget who the OG was, who was playing literally 100 games a season when he was 18 years old. That's Pedri, man. He's in those conversations. And for some people, hey, he might even top them. I think last season was probably his best one yet. He was arguably the best midfielder in Europe. Let's not forget the quality that Pedri Gonzalez possesses on a night-to-night -night basis and then Xavi made a second success a second successive uh substitution Andreas Christensen brought him on as almost a defensive midfielder we've seen him execute that role actually a few times for Chelsea in the past for Denmark most notably and for Barcelona he's filled into that role here and there but he brought him on and again two minutes later found himself completely unmarked unchallenged in the box to head home and, and make it 3-2 to Barcelona look it was a nice cross it was a nice header but Donnarumma man so 
so poor. Like I said, that first goal, you could have kind of looked at him and said, why did he come out? And I think that might have played on his head later in the game. So for the Christensen goal, he probably thought to himself, let me stay on my line. The wrong decision, man. You're six foot eight. You're an absolute beast. Go out there, claim the ball, and start a counterattack for PSG. What are you doing staying on your line? You're six eight, bro. Donnarumma, man. It's... A lot of people before this game were telling me that Donnarumma this year has had a really good year and he's looked like one of the best goalkeepers in Europe. Look, man, Donnarumma since Milan for me has never been the same. Since Euro 2021 has never been the same goalkeeper for me. And I'm also of the opinion, call this like lazy analysis or something, but I almost feel like sometimes he's too big. And it's not like he's like, Courtois is huge, but Courtois fills his frame. Courtois is comfortable in his body. Donnarumma, sometimes I get the impression that he's not actually comfortable in his body. Like he's an awkward six foot eight. He, he, he struggles really to get down low at times because of how big and awkward he is. That's my opinion. I'm not a huge fan of him. And today, he definitely did not have a good game whatsoever. Barcelona obviously hold on. A massive 3-2 performance. They're going to go into the, the, the second leg at home now, wherever they're playing, not the Camp Nou. But um, with a massive advantage. And for me, they are the favorites. Because, look, I had PSG going through in the first leg. But I had PSG going through in the first leg. Most notably because of one guy. And that's Kylian Mbappe. And let's talk about him, right? Mbappe, for me, I've said it time and time again this year, he's the best player on the planet. But that's one of the worst performances I can remember seeing Kylian Mbappe play, especially at this stage. The Champions League has been made into Kylian Mbappe's playground the last few years. Every single big knockout game that he plays, home or away, he finds a way of putting his mark on authority. But this was awful from him. And what was more disappointing for me from Mbappe wasn't even the fact that, like, oh, he was trying stuff and it wasn't working out. Because like I said about Vinny, Vinny, Mbappe, Leao, like, they're the style of player that they're high risk, high reward. They're going to try things a lot. They're going to fail things a lot, but you keep them in and you trust in them because of their ability to pull off that one world-class play that no one else can make. I get that. That's the kind of player they are. My issue with Mbappe last night wasn't the fact that he was trying stuff and, and failing like a Vinny. My issue was that he was quiet. He was timid. It's like he didn't want the responsibility. This is your team. You're the captain. I know you're leaving in a few months, but this team has been assembled in your image. You brought your friends along. They, they got rid of the guys you didn't like. You're the man on this team. You're the captain. You're the guy who they pay all this money. And the performance for me was a disgrace. I'm sorry. I'm a big Mbappe fan. Again, best player in the world for me. He has been since 2021. So what I'm saying here doesn't come from a place of malice. It comes from a place of concern. That was not a performance worthy of best in the world shouts. Nowhere near it. I was seeing Mbappe half the time hugging the touchline, staying wide basically waiting for the ball to come to him. And I know this guy's not messy. I know he's not going to pick up the ball in the half spaces. I know he's not going to pick up the ball at halfway and dictate play. I know he's not that kind of player. But damn, bro. Get on the ball and make things happen, man. You were way too, what's the word? Unassertive. And that's not a word I associate with Kylian Mbappe. I associate words with Kylian Mbappe as being never afraid of the moment. Wanting to grab the game by the scruff of the neck. Game changer. Moments of brilliance. I didn't see any of that from Kylian Mbappe. Again, I was seeing Usman Dembele pick up the ball and try to be that. Unfortunately, he doesn't have what it takes to be that guy. But that's what I want to see from Kylian Mbappe. So for me, eat your licks yesterday, Kylian Mbappe. Like, you're going to take a lot of criticism, a lot of flack. I'm looking at you in the second uh, second leg because it's going to be the last Champions League game you potentially ever play for PSG before you run off, the PS uh, run off to Real Madrid. Show these guys what they're losing, man. And especially against Barcelona. This is a team that's going to be your future rival, your future op for the next 10 years. And I've seen what you've done against Barcelona in the past. A hat trick at the Camp Nou. We, I say we, PSG need that kind of performance, that level of, of play against Barcelona if they have any chance, any chance. I was massively disappointed, but there's still 90 minutes more left in this in this tie. And look, it's for me, it's as simple as this. If Kylian Mbappe doesn't show up, Barcelona are going through to the semifinal. And hell, if Barcelona go through the semifinal, I think they're going to the final. I think they'll be either of Dortmund or or Atletico. But if Kylian Mbappe shows up, ladies and gentlemen, we will be entertained and we will have a meal. But it's as simple as that. If he doesn't turn up, they have no chance. If he does, the sky's the limit for PSG. Next up was, of course, Atletico versus Dortmund. And I was on the record of saying, I think Dortmund is the most underrated team left in this competition. And I said at the start of the video, I feel like there's some teams out there that people have like these preconceived notions about, these unconscious biases. And that's without even like updating their opinion, like seeing more evidence to kind of like, I don't know, alter their opinion if need be. And I think when you talk about Atletico Madrid and Dortmund, that can be said about both of them. Uh, Atletico Madrid had that performance against Inter where they were irresistible. It genuinely gave me the feel of like the, Inter, the Atletico Madrid of Diego Costa and Diego Godin and uh, Gabi and Courtois and Miranda and Juan Fran, like the classic old school, no nonsense 
defense, Atletico Madrid. Amazing at, at the Wanda Metro Metropolitana. Everyone knows that. At home, they're an unbelievable team. But I do feel like people started overrating them from that, uh, that Inter game. It was a great performance. They knocked out one of the favorites. But this is not that team. They are 20 points behind in La Liga for a reason. Yes, they, they've beaten Real Madrid a few times this season. They have a good record against them. But they say Styles make fights. So against Real Madrid, they're great. Against other teams, they're not so great. They concede more goals than any Diego Simeone team I've ever seen in my life. And going forward, it's not like we have Costa. It's not like they have Carrasco. It's not like they have Arda Turan, who are just going to bang in goals. They have Morata, who I think is actually underhated, overhated, excuse me, but still not a world-class world beater by any stretch of the imagination. They have Griezmann, who's a baller. Griezmann is their best player by a mile and one of the best players in the world for me. But they don't have, like, all of a sudden this unfallible team. They are beatable. Uh, and then you look at Dortmund, who, again, I just feel like people have seen them choke so many Bundesliga titles in the past. Champions League, they haven't really been a huge presence in that competition for a while. And People just look at Dortmund and think, oh, they're easy to beat. They're rollover for anybody. Atletico, they got this. Excuse me, have we watched Dortmund this season? The group that we all looked at and agreed was the group of death between PSG, Milan, and Newcastle. Everyone had finished Dortmund finishing bottom of that group. They finished top. They played PSV in the round of 16. And PSV this season have been incredible. They are having an amazing season in the Dutch league. They got out of a group of Sevilla and Arsenal. Took care of business against them too. In the league as well this year, they're starting to pick up form. They're starting to find some momentum. Beating Bayern the other day at the, the Allianz Arena. Why are we all pretending like Dortmund versus Atletico was like going to be the most one-sided tie in, in, in history? Oh, everyone wants to play Dortmund. Excuse me. Dortmund are making the count of themselves in this competition that you cannot underestimate them. And look, they lost this game 2-1. Quickly went down 2-0 in this game as well, too. And I think the one mistake that uh, Dortmund made, uh, Tezic, I think the, the coach's name is, and that Atletico Madrid really capitalized on was Dortmund playing out from the back was very predictable, in my opinion. And Atletico hit them. First 10 minutes, first 20 minutes, you know at the Wanda, the crowd is going to be on fire. They're going to be screaming down the opponent's neck. And Atletico Madrid are going to come out on top, on top form. And they did that. They basically sucker punched Dortmund early into the game, got them for two goals, hit them with kind of hard presses from, from their own buildup and, and went up 2-0. But if you notice that game, I don't know if any of you guys watched it or if you guys were too focused on Barca PSG, but after the first 20, 30 minutes, Dortmund controlled the rest of the game. Dortmund basically had a full control of that game. Okay, Atletico hit them with a counterattack once or twice, but Dortmund were kind of cruising in that game, I believe. Then the goal com for, comes from me from two players that have to start in the second leg, and that's Julian Brandt and that's Sebastian Allaire. No disrespect to Falkirk. Good striker, good Bundesliga forward. He'll score you goals in that competition. But Haller for me, has to be starting for Dortmund when he's fit. And Julian Brandt, when he came on for me, okay, look, you have nice players in Sancho and uh, Adeyemi and uh, Bino Gittens when he came on. I thought he played really well. But Julian Brandt is like the one natural chance creator, the one natural playmaker. And it's his pass that kind of splits the defense and allows Sebastian Haller to go through to make it 2-1. He almost scores himself at the end. And you notice when he came onto the pitch, everything is going through him. He's a natural number 10. So I think both of those two have to start. And for all the talk about the Wanda, the Wanda, the Wanda, are we forgetting now that the Sinyala Duna Park has one of the craziest atmospheres in all of European football? Are we, are we pretending now that that's not a fortress of a stadium? I'm sorry, guys. I, may, I might still have Atletico Madrid progressing by the skin of their teeth, but this was never going to be an easy tie, and it's damn sure not going to be an easy tie going to the Sinyal, man. No chance about it. Please put some respect on Dortmund. They do need some big players to, to step up, right? Sancho, for me, was a bit ineffective, had some nice touches here and there, got past his man once or twice, but the final action, kind of lacking. Bino Gittens, I thought, again, probably another one that I would look to start in the second leg. I thought he made a really good impact, but also... I understand that Tezic uses him as like an impact substitute. But I think Dortmund are going to come out in that game on fire. And it's going to be up to Atletico, who again, are not your typical defensive juggernaut Atletico, to keep these guys out. They're going to be on the back foot for much of this game. What do they have for us? So I'm going to stick with my original prediction. I think Atletico go through, but barely. And Barca PSG, I can't lie, guys. Mbappe must rise. Because if he doesn't, this is another Champions League disaster class from PSG. Let me know what you guys thought about both of those games. Let me know what you think is going to happen in the next quarterfinal, second leg. Does Dortmund have what it takes to get past Atletico? Can Mbappe kind of rise up to the occasion like he normally does in this competition and lead PSG past Barca? And let me know what you think about the competition this year. With that being said, it's been your boy Lies. Like, share, subscribe. This is the Clips channel. All that other good stuff that you're not going to see on my main channel. And yeah, we'll see you when we see you. Peace.